Okay, one second. Okay, perfect. And okay, so welcome everybody. I hope the conference has been going well so far. Um, like Jim mentioned, my name's Daria Stepanian, and today I'll be presenting, or Lauren Mariam and I will be presenting on brain spotting. So I'll be doing a little bit of um, information on what is brain spotting and some of the principles, and then we'll move on to um, Lauren and Mariam um, with an experiential demonstration. And then Mariam will talk a little bit more about um, different aspects of brain spotting and um, specialties. So I guess let's begin. Uh, so what exactly is brain spotting? So the human brain, body, and psyche possess a remarkable and innate capacity to heal itself. And so brain spotting is a somatic therapeutic approach that uh, harnesses this innate ability um, by exploring the relationship between the eye movements, um, between eye movements and emotional processing. So where you look affects how you feel is a core principle in brain spotting. And um, it involves specific eye positions in our visual field, um, which are called brain spots. And um, it's correlation with emotional activation um, centers in our brain. So brain spotting Gloria, helps. Yes. The, the PowerPoint's not moving. Oh, it's not supposed to. Oh, okay. What Sorry, do you mean? I thought you were on the first page, the slide. Yeah, it's supposed to be on what is brain spotting. It's not. Oh, really? It's not changing? It's no. just the first now. It's just the first. Okay, let me see. It's with our names. Now it's changing. Now you can see it? Okay, maybe I'll just leave it to this then because the other version didn't. Okay, I'll just leave it to this. Um, so where was I? Oh, yeah. So um, we're finding brain spots in our visual field, um, which are called brain spots. And then we are correlating it with the emotional activation centers of our brain. And so brain spotting helps us access um, the un our unresolved traumas, emotions, and experiences that reside in the subcortical regions of our brain. And so it helps us go from a disreg dysregulated state to a more regulated state um, and to essentially find a bit more emotional stability and unlock our great um, potentials. So how did brain spotting come about? We can thank David Grant for that. And um, back in 2003, I believe, he he's actually an EMDR therapist. And so he was working with a figure ice skater. Um, I don't think that's her in the picture, but um, she was um, working with him um, to, what do you call it? Um, to work on like a triple loop that she was trying to master. And so during one of their EMDR sessions, he noticed that her eyes would start to like wobble and freeze. Um, and so he was really curious about this and he just had her hold her gaze on that spot. And to her, to his surprise, and probably to her surprise too, a significant amount of um, trauma material started to pour out of her. And so they, um, they, they processed whatever it was that she was um, sharing. And the following day, she was able to master her triple loop. So he was really um, inspired by this breakthrough, and so he started to um, he started to observe these like eye anomalies with his other EMDR clients, shared it with colleagues, and um, they all pretty much found like really powerful like emotional reactions and processes in their clients. So this is why he really emphasizes where you look affects how you feel. Um, so moving on to the principles and just different models. Um, so brain spotting does, um, we hold the uncertainty, I can never say this word, uncertainty principle and no assumptions model um, and the tail of the comet. So essentially in brain spotting, we try not to make any assumptions. We don't want to, we don't want to interfere with the client's um, internal process because we do have that ability to um, self-heal. And so when we, um, when we interfere with it, it kind of messes up their process. So we make no assumptions. We, we, we're not certain of anything. Um, we have to make sure that we leave aside our own biases, our discomforts, insecurities, and our own interpretations. 
Um, and we simply observe a client and maintain our curiosity with them. Um, the tail of the comment is also a metaphor that we use. Um, and basically, uh, the client is the head of the comment. As therapists, we find our way to the tail of the comment. And so we have to, uh, basically, the client is guiding us. And this is where that no assumptions model comes into place um, because we we don't want to make any assumptions, again, that the client is thinking this or feeling this way. We want to allow the client to uh, bring that to us and we want to go where, go where they go. Um, we also find our way to the tail of the comet by attuning with them and by helping create a frame. Um, so let me see what else there is here. Okay, so we're moving on to the dual attunement um, frame. And this is another core element. And it involves the therapist to obviously attune to the internal um, experiences of the client, as well as their external responses. So this dual attunement creates um, a dynamic therapeutic approach, fosters trust, safety, and exploration for the client. And it consists of these two um, these two different frames. We've got the neurobiological frame, um, which is um, besides helping the client find their brain spot, um, we attune to their like physical cues, their nonverbal expressions, subtle shifts in their body language. And so we're really just connecting to that part of the client. But we, there's also this big relational frame that, that happens. And um, it's also known as holding the environment in other therapies. Uh, but basically, the therapist is tuning into the client's internal experiences, such as their, um, such as their emotions, their thoughts, um, their sensations. Um, we are trying to maintain a... Uh, what do you call it? We're trying to maintain obviously a non-judgmental non environment for the client, allow space for the client, um, but also we're going with where they're going. And so kind of combining the two helps us stay, stay at the tail of the comment, like I mentioned earlier, um, but also follow where the client is going. Um, next, we've got the limbic countertransference. So I'm sure all of you have heard of transference and countertransference, but this one is slightly, it's slightly different in brain spotting, not really that different. Um, but this is um, obviously when a therapist is having a emotional reaction or response to the client. But um, this is, when we come into session, we're obviously coming in with our own personal like frame, right? because we're all, we're all human. And we have a response to the client, which is our limbic countertransference. So the client's, it, the, client, it, the client's processing affects our processing, and then our processing affects their processing. And so this happens because our limbic systems are interacting with one another. Um, it's almost like an unconscious thing that happens, but it's really important that we are on top of our experiences in session so that it doesn't interfere with the client. So this is where WAIT comes into play, which stands for why am I talking? And um, it's it's a kind of a good grounding post for, for, client, for therapists because it helps us to, or it reminds us to pause, actively listen, and to reflect on our own um, contributions. Um, and it helps us stay at the tail of the comment because, again, we don't want to interrupt the, the client's processing with our own bias or our own emotional reaction. Uh, all right, the fun stuff, the brain. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, brain spotting helps us move from a dysregulated to a regulated state. Um, as much as I love talk therapy, um, it only stays in the neocortex. And so it doesn't access the same parts of the brain that um, we're accessing during brain spotting. So brain spotting is a bottom-up model and it works with the three um, regions of the brain that are listed on the PowerPoint. So we've got the allocortex, 
which is the limbic system. And it includes things like the hippocampus, the amygdala, and it plays a crucial role in regulating and processing emotions and memory. Um, we are accessing the agranular esocortex, um, which is in the prefrontal cortex of our brain, but kind of like a weird location, um, but it's located in the V of our nose between our eyes. So it's like somewhere in this general area. And so this involves more with like regulation of the brain and the body. And lastly, the superior colliculus, which I think is that really interesting, but this structure is located in the midbrain and um, it plays a crucial role in uh, processing visual information and coordinating eye movements. So in the context of brain spotting, the superior colliculus has significant involvement because it links to the limbic system and it helps with processing and regulation. Um, all right. By the way, I don't think I mentioned that if there's any questions, we have left about 10 minutes at the end of our presentation for questions. So just wanna throw that out there because I know I'm going through a lot of things. So I'm sure you, you all will have some questions. Uh, so models of brain spotting. So we've got two models. We've got the activation model and the resource model. The activation model is your basic, it's, it's the basic model of brain spotting. And it's for clients who can comfortably tolerate um, higher levels of activation, basically. Um, the brain spot is paired with a location in their body that feels that activation. And from there, we simply process. In contrast, the resource model um, with the resource model, we guide clients to find a resource brain spot, which um, that matches an area in their body that feels a little bit more calm, a little more neutral, uh, more grounded, or simply just like less activated than um, what it might be in the activation model. And so this is used more for clients who become very easily overwhelmed. Um, and it just kind of cocoons them a little bit more, makes them feel a little safer to process. All right, so before I talk about this slide, I do want to mention um, that during brain spotting, we do use something called a pointer. I'm sure you guys have seen stuff like this, but we use it to find the brain spots. And then we also have the client, um, we have the client listen to bilateral music on their headphones while they listen to us on their computer screen. So, Basically, the um, we start session by the client um, talking about the issue that they want to work on. We help the client get activated um, and have some sort of somatic response, like feeling tightness in their chest, knots in their stomach, eyes tearing up. Uh, from there, we take their SUDS level on a scale of zero to 10. We help them um, locate the um, a part of their body that feels activated. And then we help them find the brain spot. And Mariam and Lauren will, will help demonstrate that. Once we find the brain spot, we move on to the clients mindfully processing. At one point, um, we do go back to the beginning and assess if there's been any changes in, the, um, in their activation or in how they're feeling about the issue that they wanted to work on. And um, if they've reached a pretty low level on their suds, we um, do something called squeezing the lemon, um, not necessarily making lemonade, but um, we help them find, not find, um, but we're basically just checking to see if there's any, any remnants of their issues that we can process. Uh, so we've got four different setups, four main setups, I suppose. Um, and again, you'll see some of these in the demonstrations. So I'll just really briefly go through each one. Outside window is great for clients who easily dissociate, who, who are constantly saying, well, I don't know how I feel. I can't feel the sadness in my body. They just It just feels the same all around. Um, they might've had loss of consciousness, pre-verbal traumas. And so it's great for those types of clients. Um, inside window is typically used for clients who just, easily identify um who can easily identify their activation in their body they're noticing the knots in their stomach tightness in their chest um gay spotting um we all do gay spotting all our clients do gay spotting 
it's when we when our eyes naturally fixate on um on a on a point anywhere in our visual field um when we're thinking about something or speaking about something and then the last one is the resource brain spot which is very similar to the resource model that i mentioned earlier and this is really helpful for clients who are in fragile states who are going to like they're going to share something really really heavy and it's just really hard for them to to speak about it and so the resource brain spot um helps cocoon them a little bit more helps them feel a little safer within um, themselves and it also helps tighten that frame um, so that they can actually process a little bit better um, and let's see so um, brain spotting has many different trainings we've got phases one through four or I believe, and then there's a bunch of specialty trainings as well, which is like really, really awesome. Uh, but if any of you are interested in being brain spotting certified, um, there are two options. With both options, you do have to take phase one and phase two, and you have to record at least 50 brain spotting sessions um, with clients. And then with option one, you have to do at least six hours of individual consultation with an approved brain spotting consultant, or um, option two is attend a brain spotting intensive, which uh, with David Grant or an approved mm -hmm. intensive trainer. Um, the intensives are, I believe, like a five day um, training. Um, yeah. yeah, it's like a five day training. And it's just really intense. I haven't done it. So Mariam or Lauren can probably speak a little bit more on it. Um, and then lastly, oh, here. Um, if you are interested in brain spotting, please check out their website, brainspotting.com. All the information is on there. Um, David Grant also wrote a book. It's a small little book, which is great. Um, it's called Brain Spotting, and it could be found on Amazon. Um, I did also link the link these two sites um, on the informational handout that I think was emailed um, a couple days ago. So um, now we'll move on to the experiential portion of our presentation with Lauren and Mariam. So take it away, ladies. Hello. Um, I just want to quickly say something about the certification. Um, when Daria said record, you just have to document. You don't actually have to record, like film your sessions. Oh yeah, that's yes. Um. So Daria, if you could take down the pres the PowerPoint, oh, yeah. and um, should I just stop sharing the screen? How do I do that? Yeah, I think okay. so. And so okay. Mariam and I are going to do a demonstration of brain spotting. I'm going to ask all of you that have your camera on to please turn it off. And in the top right of your Zoom, you'll see view. If you click on that, you can click hide non-video participants. So then you will just see Mariam and I, and you get to see brain spotting at its fullest. Um, and you won't see everybody's names written about out. And if anybody is having trouble with that, feel free to talk or pop in the chat to get clarity as to what I meant by that. So if Kathy and Elizabeth could hide their videos, that would be great. If you want, I can do that as the host. Would you like me that to do works that, Elizabeth too. and Kathy? Okay. All right. So I'm going to do brain spotting. As Daria said, um, it's, it, it's different in that it's not talk therapy. And so I'm not going to be saying a lot of things. And Mariam is going to be doing the work. And she may or may not say things. It depends on the client. Sometimes you have clients who are super silent the entire time and some who are very loud and very um, verbal processors. And it just depends. And sometimes that changes depending on the day. So I also want to say something before we begin. So you guys are not worried about well, my well-being. I'm going to come up with a quite in, intense issue, but I've processed that through brain spotting already. I just want this to be a demonstration. So it's not that it's not real, it is, but it's not like I'm processing it in 15 minutes, she's gonna let me hanging. So this is done for the purposes of demonstration. And even though the issue is real, I can say I pretty much processed it. Um, <clears throat> so I just don't want people to be freaked out. It's like, oh, we got it or activated and now what's gonna happen? Because I'll have to present right after that. So just, I'm fine, but I want you to see a little bit how the process works 
Yeah. And I'm also, I'm going to be doing just about 10 or 15 minutes. Is that what we have time for? Yeah. Um, so it's not going to be a full 50 minute session. I'm going to pretend that we have five minutes left as if it was a full session. So, um, but the setup and all of that. All right. Um, so one thing with telehealth is that you never know where the client's eyes are and you want to be at eye position. So one thing I do just before I start sessions is find out where the pointer needs to be to be at Mariam's eye level. So does it need to be higher or lower? No, that's fine. Perfect. So, so I'm put it down now. Go ahead, Mariam. So the issue I want to process is that very recently um, something really bad happened. Um, one of my girlfriend's daughter passed away quite unexpectedly, not an accident, just from a pneumonia. And She's not very close to my daughter's age, but it's that generation. So for me, I developed this anxiety about my own kid. She's 21. She's at University of Davis. She's graduating this coming June. I've always been a mother who kind of pushed her to be adventurous, or if not pushed, I've always been very supportive. And I, um, I developed this anxiety for her safety. And I noticed myself like she would be talking about her summer plan. She's going to go to Armenia. Then she was thinking of maybe going to Europe for a year. And I, I was like, well, I don't know, maybe you can come back and just stay home. And I, I caught myself that it's all about my stuff and how traumatic this death has been for me. So I went and I worked on that issue. But even now, as I'm talking about that, I still have that activation and that being torn between wanting to be the mom that's very supportive and also wanting just to grab her, bring her home and just have her close to me. So, yeah, so that's what I would like to work on. Okay. And as you're talking about that today, where are you noticing that coming up in your body? <laughs> I have it like um, in my, in my like upper stomach and then I can just feel it like, it's like a ball of anxiety that's like gliding up and down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you think about that ball of anxiety that's going up and down and in your stomach, if you had to give it a number from zero to 10, zero being nothing at all and 10 being incredibly intense, where does that fall for you? I think around five, okay. five, maybe six. So yeah. right, it just went down a notch because, but when I was talking, it was almost about six. Does mm -hmm. that feel like an okay place to work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So... I can see that you have a gaze spot over to your left, but we're going to use the pointer to see if there's anything that comes up, or we can also use that gaze spot. So when you think about that six and that feeling in your stomach and the anxiety, does it feel stronger here? Here? Or here? In the middle. So I'm going to move over really slowly just to see if we can refine that spot. Let me know when it gets more intense for you. There. Okay. I'm going to go up. Let me know if it's going up or down. That's getting weaker. Okay. I'm going to go down. Right there. Okay, so I'm just gonna refine and get this set up. Is it? Do I need to go down a little bit, or is it safe? Oh, you did go a little bit on my yeah, a little bit closer to you, right there. Okay. So feel free to talk as little or as much as you want. I'm here if you need me. Just feel that it's not rolling anymore. It just stopped and it feels so like stuck, like it's hard to breathe. Okay. And so that's not too much for me, but does it feel like too much for you that we need to do a resource? Okay. No, no, I'm fine. All right. I'm also, it feels like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pushing my feet and it seems like it's grounding me a little bit. Okay, I love that. Mm -hmm.
just thought about my mom. Um, I was 17 when I left home and I went to study. We were living in Armenia. And I went to study in, in, in Moscow and we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have internet. So I was the only connection. Once a week, I would go to a special like a post office in Moscow and I would call her and uh, she had to wait the whole week to know how I was doing. And I just thought about like, um, how she was doing that. Um, and um, how lucky I was that she, in spite of that, like she was, I'm sure she was worried, but she kind of supported me. And those were the best years um, of my life, my five years, my student years. So I don't know why I just had that image of her not really hearing from me for a whole week. And I, I get to talk to my daughter anytime I want. She's just one phone click away. And I also thought that my, my, my girlfriend's daughter actually died when my girlfriend was home in their home's bathroom. She didn't, she was not away. She was home. So that kind of didn't uh, change anything. So I feel like I want to look somewhere else. Is that? That's totally fine. It, this pointer will be right here, but go ahead and look wherever you want. I don't know. I just thought about how happy and how excited my kid is to be doing what she's doing. And then I thought how worth it is, even me just getting worried sometimes and I just I don't know I have this beautiful view from my window and it's really far and I, I don't know I just wanted to look there <sighs> So interesting. I mean, this thing that I had that stopped moving and I just felt so stuck. It was so like tight, like a tight ball. And I feel like it expanded, expanded, and then it kind of loosened. So I kind of can feel it, but it's so like almost soft. And I don't know, like the image that I had, I almost like had a visual image. It feels like it turned into felt, mm. like soft. And even though I can still feel it, but it's kind of like not this 
hard uh, pull. It's kind of like a feltish, and it's soft and it's kind of open, so I can breathe. I love that. If you go back to that number at the beginning, that five or six. What do you think it's at now? Right now it's two, but it almost feels like it, it feels like two has always been my base number when it comes to my daughter, maybe one or two. Mm -hmm. So there's some, some worrying. I don't know if I want it to be zero, actually. Okay. It's kind of this like part of my being a mom, I don't know. Yeah. Do you want to keep processing or do you, that idea of like, you don't know if you want it to be a zero, do you want to process down to a zero or do you want to stop there? Or do you want to see if there's anything more to get out? Yeah, I just want to stay a little bit more, just see what else comes out. Okay. So Mariam, we have just about five minutes left. Just noticing that feeling in your stomach. It's so funny because I um I have that one and a half in my head, but I have zero in my body. Like I have the thought, is she okay? But I don't feel the activation in my body. It's kind of very grounded. So sometimes when we get down to that zero, something we like to do is called squeeze the lemon, where we can try and bring your activation back up and see if there's anything else to get out. So when you're thinking about your daughter graduating and the traveling she's going to do and her safety and what you were bringing up at the beginning, do you notice anything else coming up around that? Yeah, a little bit of my spine, it went something. You just, you've gone and done it, didn't you? Uh, I just, yeah. it just went up my spine a little bit, yeah. All right, well, let's notice what's going on in your spine. Just a little electrical thing, kind of. But, but, but I'm also, like, at the same time, I have the calm and the breathing and the feet. So it's kind of, okay. Right here, just a little bit longer. Hmm. All right, so our time is just about up. Do you feel like there's, it's okay to bring this down or is there a little bit more work to do? It's okay, bring it down. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all, you can turn your videos back on. Come back.
So Mariam did a great job in, in um, demonstrating why weight is so important because there were things she said, I was like, I can't say anything. I'm just gonna see what happens. And <laughs> she was able to explore and it's really hard. Lorraine, you said it, it's really hard to not talk, but when you don't, your client's gonna say something even deeper than what you're gonna come up with. It's same in session, right? Like if we wait just a second, our client might say something more than, um, than we could have come up with. And so, so if you guys don't mind, we're just going to go to the end of the presentation. And then, um, so if you have any questions about the, the process, the demo for Learn For Me, maybe we can save it till the end, if you guys don't mind. So we can just go ahead. How much time I have? About 10 minutes, 15? Yep. Yeah. Five. 15, yeah. Yeah, we could do 15, yeah. Okay. Um, let me just share my screen with you again, because there's some more PowerPoint slides, I believe. So. Okay. Um, okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Can you guys see me, or you're seeing um, uh, Daria? I see you. Okay, so I'm in that little window. Okay, great. But it's very good because I don't see myself because it's, it's good that you can see me though. So um, Daria kind of walked you through the different parts and fundamental principles of the model. And then Lauren, I showed you a little bit. Again, it's just a glimpse of what it looks like in, in, in practice. And what I wanted to do before I move to talk about some special need trainings that there are many, and I'm gonna only talk about some of them. Some of them I took myself and um, also the ones I'm interested in taking, but there are more. But before um, moving to specialty trainings that are offered in brain, brain spotting community by brain spotting therapists, I wanted to just say a few words about David's neuro experiential model. He, kind of formulated it and gave a keynote speech at the last, which is second, brain spotting conference a couple of years ago. And then <clears throat> he reiterated it in his interviews. He taught it in bits and pieces in his different teachings. And um, I, I just thought that it was important to talk about this model. and since we are so limited in time, I just thought that it might be helpful to talk about the opportunities and also the challenges of this model. Um, so among the opportunities is the inclusive approach. What that means is that this model integrates concepts from both Western and Eastern healing traditions. And that integrative approach allows uh, as therapists to adapt our um, therapeutic presence approach to the unique needs of clients depending on their cultural and personal background. The dynamic development, which is very important for me um, personally, because it's a very uh, living and breathing model that encourages therapists to contribute and refine the model collaboratively. The model is uh, evolving, it's growing and evolving through collective input and insights. And as we talk later about the specialty trainings, you'll have an opportunity to see. Everybody who, um, who knows David, who heard him teach, um, knows this, um, his stand that is extremely open to any kinds of suggestions and feedbacks. He says, well, that's been my experience. Well, that's what I think. And then take this and then go and try and do it your way and try it your way and bring in new ideas and new suggestions. And he always says that. You don't need my permission to do that. <laughs> and I find it fascinating because uh, for a lot of approaches, for a lot of uh, schools of thought in psychology, we have a more dogmatic and more rigid. This is the way you do it, very protocol based. This is a living and breathing model that is constantly evolving through the input of all the brain spotting therapists. 
And then finally, another opportunity, which is advantage, or what we love about this model, is its nonlinear healing process. The model accepts that healing is not a linear path, but it's rather a spiral of unpredictable growth and change and transformation. And this goes uh, very much with the uncertainty principle that Daria was talking about. You start the session, you start the path, you're following the client, not only you're following them, you have no idea where it's going and they have no idea where it's going. And then it's just a journey and it's not linear. It's really a spiral because they can process something, then they process it throughout the week, then they can, can come back, the activation could be gone or it could be back up and maybe they wanna continue processing it or maybe they wanna process something else. So it's much more complex than just a linear path. Um, the flexibility, um, allows for deeper and more personalized therapy tailored to client's unique journey, that nonlinear healing process. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about the challenges that this model faces. Um, there is, um, it's not just a different model, it's a paradigm shift. Um, and the traditional, and there there is a, or there can be, or there is a conflict or clash with a, um, more conventional psychology practice, practices, which often rely on standardized protocols like DSM-5 for diagnosis. This model rejects this rigid categorization. And instead, it favors a more fluid and individualized approach. David does not talk about symptoms. In fact, he believes that symptoms are the multiple ways in which our clients adapted in the face of trauma. So when even when we do intake, it's very different from the traditional symptom gathering and then trying to categorize it and put it under a certain label with DSM-5. And I can really appreciate the shift and change because for years I worked in a community-based clinic. So I'm very um, familiar with the whole diagnostic thing and using the manual. And I can see how different and appreciate how different this model is. There are also some challenges with research and validation because this subjective and very dynamic and constantly evolving nature of the model makes it challenging to fit into a conventional research framework. The traditional hypothesis testing studies struggle to capture the nuances and adaptability and it looks like uh, we might need new research methodologies to be able to do more studies on brain spotting, even though a lot is being done, especially brain spotting works very closely with neuropsychologists, neuroscientists, the Mer Del Monte is one of them. And there is a lot of research happening. I think he's based in, um, in Germany and his research institute is doing a lot of research on brain spotting. And finally, the therapeutic skill. Um, this model demands a quite advanced skill for um, attunement. But even more than that, what I found challenging is this um, willingness to embra embrace the uncertainty and this moving beyond struct structured interventions. And also, going into this very client-led process, because even, I think so, even in more traditional client-centered approaches, therapists somehow is always per perceived as an expert or an authority on the subject. And all of a sudden you are kind of giving it up. You're holding the frame and you're letting it unfold. And what Lauren said is so true. It's so deep in us seated. There is something that you're like, oh yeah, here's my insight and my expert interpretation. And then you just need to, like David says, wait and then wait and then wait. And then when you're kind of done waiting, wait some more. So, and then all of a sudden the client says something amazing and you're so happy that you did not 
interfere with your um with what you thought amazing insight or interpretation. So that that that's that about the model. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about how this amazing brain spotting therapist, my colleagues, our colleagues, contribute to the model and how the model is constantly evolving and um, how this model is so versatile to be adapted um, to work with special populations, with, with special issues, um, and how it can be integrated with different approaches. So the first one I wanna talk about, just a few words about expansion model. Yes, and also what I wanna say, what is amazing, that most of these specialty trainings, they kind of grow out of the seeds that David planted in his teachings, phase one, two, but mostly phase three and four. And then those little parts of his teaching, some, some therapists just came and they expanded on them and they made a specialty training. So for example, the exp expansion model that was developed by Lisa Larson, uh, David teaches expansion in his, um, I think phase three training. And like Lisa says, expansion model is the specialty training to fast track your clients to manifest their deepest desires and dreams. It is finding the highest potential in your client to achieve their goal, achieve their desired state and create a frame for them to expand, fully expand into it. Like Lisa says to infinity. If on activation scale, we have zero to 10, with Lisa, we have zero to infinity in expansion model. I use this model when I work with my most vulnerable and fragile clients for whom the pain is so intense, so strong that even if we resource them, it's unbearable. So then you go to the place, what is it in you that can help you bear the unbearable? That's actually one of the questions Lisa asks. That's expansion training um, for body and brain spotting. We have a uh, Reiki and brain spotting. It's very interesting in this teaching, they explore the uh, brain wave functions, the research, they explore how, which parts of the brain and body are especially benefit from the combination of these two healing approaches. There is a training that I absolutely love. It's taught by Serene Calkins and Mary O'Rourke. It's called From Freeze to Thought. It consists of two parts. And the first part basically explains and explores and teaches what happens to body during brain spotting on tissue level, on cellular level, and on biochemistry level. And the second part, um, the second part talks about the fact that we're we are usually not hurt and not alone when we are being traumatized or hurt. So the healing also shouldn't happen in isolation. And the healing is so much more profound when we have an attuned listener to tell our story. And this second part of this training gives us tools to clear our own trauma for therapists. So we're able to go to a different level of attunement with our clients. It's a very powerful training. I love that training. There is brain spotting and weight loss. I think it's Stephanie Newman and it uses expansion models set up to work with a specific issue. Um, Daria spoke a little bit about limbic countertransference and there is a training that is done by Sherry Lindbergh and Cynthia Schwartzberg about um, limbic countertransference, how to recognize it how to notice its manifestations while well, saying that it's ubiquitous, it's unavoidable. Uh, they use uh, Stephen Porges' polyvagal theory to explain how we go to our fight, flight, freeze, and fawn mode and how it can manifest in our sessions with clients and how to manage it, how to deal with it. Um, next one, please. Well, some of these are self-explanatory, so I'm not gonna talk too much or even the names. There is brain spotting with children and adolescents that is uh, taught by Monica Bauman with LGBTQIA 
community with first responders and military. The, the LGBTQIA is taught by uh, Pai Fry. It's my mentor. This is the person I trained with and did an intensive with, and she's the one who um, certified me as a consultant. Then there is a uh, brain spotting with first responders and military. Um, there is, uh, again, by Stephanie Newman, there is mindful co-regulation co in relationships. Um, Sherry Lindbergh, Sherry Lindbergh teaches it, and it's basically brain spotting with couples. Uh, connecting the rainbow, I love this training. This is for people who experienced perinatal trauma, trauma and uh, she does an overview of, it's Jaina Glass who teaches it, she does an overview of common traumas which are associated with perinatal uh, and pregnancy periods. Echoes and ripples. This is a training, uh, it's done by Regina Fardinia. And this is a training that I, as a therapist who works a lot with Armenian community, I find it very helpful because she uses um, historical and intergenerational lens combined with brain spotting. And she's exploring the impact, the trauma historically had on different communities, how it creates historical ripples through generations. And the training teaches therapists to listen for cues, which allow us to tap into um, deeper aspects connecting, connected with historical experience. And also in this training, there is a setup that works with autoimmune disorders, which she believes can be connected to intergenerational trauma. There is brain spotting and spirituality training. There is brain spotting to heal shame, self-esteem and imposter syndrome, really good one. And uh, brain spotting and money, which kind of combines the brain spotting with financial psychology. This is a good example, how versatile brain spotting is, how it can be integrated with other approaches. There is a brain spotting intersectionality and social justice training. Oh, is it there? Oh, right there, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's an experience where you have a demo and then you break into dyads and you work with each other. And it kind of um, teaches you how to integrate intersectionality and social justice and lens into the whole process. And this training gives clinicians an opportunity to um, kind of get in touch with their own social identity, that of the client, and observe, notice, and be aware of how they overlap in the session, what comes up as a result of it, and how it affects the whole process. And how this awareness of your own social identity and the other person's and the need for the client to be seen as they identify themselves, how it's very important and integral part of dual attunement and uncertainty principle. Um, okay. We did money. There is attachment spotting. I love this. It's by Jennifer Delaney. It's um, teaching us to work with individuals who had significant developmental trauma, never developed the neural networks to give and receive love. So these are for our clients who don't recognize love and they keep choosing people with whom they replay and replicate their past. And here we have the brain spotting frame and setups and she integrates it with um, uh, childhood trauma psychoeducation, which she does prior and after the actual brain spotting session, which in brain spotting language, we call it front loading when we psychoeducate our clients before and back loading. There is dissociative identity phenomena, attachment, developmental and traumatic wounding and parts. 
it's supposed to be um, it's the same training. Um, it's kind of broken into two parts, but it's the, supposed to be part of the same sentence. Just want you to notice that Connie, who's teaching this training, we are used to saying the ID, dissociative identity disorder. She changed it to phenomena. So she calls it a phenomena. And uh, this training equips practitioners with tools to assess and address one of the most challenging conditions that we see in our practice is dissociative identity phenomena. And she brings in the newest um, approaches, advanced concepts and techniques to engage the neuro experiential processing with parts. And then there is brain spotting and parts work that is also taught by Sherry Lindberg and Cynthia Schwartzberg. And um, this training, I took this training and it's important for me because I'm also trained and certified in TIST, which is treatment, trauma-informed stabilization treatment by Janina Fisher. It's parts work basically combined with structural dissociation model. And personally, I, in my work, I combine brain spotting and TIST model, which is brain spotting and parts work. This is how you can brain spot different parts. Oh, there are many more trainings. I just, there would be no time to talk about all of them, but I think this kind of uh, demonstrated how versatile the model is and how, um, inclusive it can be and how easily it can be integrated with other approaches. And just to summarize and finish and to give you so time. Our, our time is almost up if we wanted to open up for questions. In summary, I just want to say that neuro expansion, neuro experiential model for brain spotting strives to be innovative, inclusive, and continues expanding and evolving. It invites therapists to embrace the uncertainty inherent in healing while focusing on attunement, presence, and collective wisdom to move our clients from dysregulation to regulation, transformation, and healing. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, we can stay here uh, and field questions from the audience at this point for anyone who